Hi, everyone. Welcome. That was my first time hearing that full song, and I was over here just kind of jamming. Um, my name is Kesey Cofield, and I'm going to be the moderator for tonight. Um, I just wanted to welcome you all to tonight's conversation. For those of you who may be joining for the first time, or if you're unfamiliar with Unerased Black Women Speak, Unerased Black Women Speak is a public engagement initiative committed to shaping narrative and creating content that tells the continuous and unfolding story of Black women. In addition to programming like this, we have an awesome podcast available on all podcast platforms. So be sure to check out this month's latest Unerased Podcast episode. A new episode drops twice a month, exploring issues that affect Black women of all ages. Black women are fully present in all meaningful aspects of our daily lives, yet too often we are left out of the conversation when mainstream media seeks to tell our stories. That is why we decided to launch Unerased Black Women Speak, a podcast series dedicated to elevating our voices and celebrating our accomplishments. Subscribe today to Unerased Black Women Speak, available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and online at unerasedbws.com. 
Awesome. So this month, Unerased Black Women Speak is launching its newest campaign. She wrote the book, which is an initiative exploring Black women authors, publishers, booksellers, book club leaders, and most of all, Black women readers. Our stories matter, our work matters, and our voices definitely matter. This evening, as a kickoff to this year-long campaign, we'll be speaking with Tracy Sherrod, who is an editorial director at Amistad and HarperCollins Publishers, and Marita Golden, who is an author and creative writing co coach. Welcome, both of you, to tonight. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Thank oh. you. I feel the same. And good to see you, Marita. Great to see you, Tracy. <laughs> Awesome. Well, welcome to you both. Uh, we are so honored that both of you have agreed to join us and kick off this new campaign of She Wrote the Book. So let's go ahead and dig into the discussion. Um, also, for those of you that are joining tonight, we would love to hear from you throughout the live. So feel free to drop any questions or comments as we move through the program. Are you ladies ready to begin? Yep. Yes. Awesome. So the first question is, as it relates to published books, do you think the stories and voices of Black women are fairly represented in publishing? Tracy, you want to take that because you're in publishing? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it, but I, I'd like to hear what you have to say before I say anything. Oh, okay. Um, you know, it's been very interesting because I have found that um, you know, Black women are always, you know, in publishing, our, our voices are, are being published. There was a time in recent years what was definitely, uh, I feel, very male-dominated. Um, and then now there seems to be a resurgence so that it's becoming a bit mixed. You know, same balance between men and women. And I, and I hope that that maintains itself. Yeah, I think this is a great time for Black writers in general, and mm -hmm. Black women have just absolutely flourished, and they're writing in so many different genres, Afrofuturism, you know, popular, commercial, romance, literary, science fiction, you name it, a Black woman is writing it. Mm -hmm. And lots of history and nonfiction, which is, hadn't been the case in the past as much. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I definitely feel that we have, you know, so many more black women authors that are just making space in a lot of the spaces that in which it was mostly dominated by men and mostly white men. So um, it's nice to see, you know, this broad variety of black women in these in these genres. Uh, so going into our next question, which kind of touches on that, why is it so important to continue to amplify the voices of black women to you? I, I I think it's important to amp amplify the voices of of all Black people. Um, I like what Marita said earlier about it's a great time in publishing for Black people, and, and it truly is. Um, it's um, easier to get. I think it's easier now than than it has been in the past to to get a deal. Um, yeah, I do. I believe that. I, mean, I think that it's so important that we continue to encourage all Black people to write. And the unique quality or the unique thing that I think Black women writers bring is that we still are marginalized within a marginalized group. Um, for all the fact that we seem to have a huge presence, you know, in media, if you look at salaries, you know, if you look at power, distribution, we're still lagging. And there are many aspects of our experience as women, as Black women in this country, that are still taboo, that we're only beginning to talk about. And so I think that it's really important that Black women be encouraged to write those stories that haven't been yet told. Completely agree. And Marita, I hear that you're working on a book now called Strong Black Women. Can you tell us more about that writing? Well, the book came out in October and it's called The Strong Black Woman, How a Myth Endangers the Physical and Mental Health of Black Women. And it's a book written in kind of a communal memoir way. I write about my own experience growing up with the Black woman, 
strong black woman syndrome and how I work my way out of the traditional definition into a new definition that prioritizes self-care. Awesome. I love that. And I think it's that's definitely an important topic, especially for black women as, you know, in our workspaces, a lot of times we tend to do it all, carry the weight of it all. So it's important to take that time to also pour into ourselves so that we're not, you know, approaching burnout so quickly. So that's an amazing work. And I definitely will be reading that. Um, so I have a question specifically for you, Tracy. Uh, what are some tips and or starting points you would suggest for black women looking to publish their work? Um, the most important part is, is to write it. Um, a lot of people will, you know, reach out about things that they're thinking about writing rather than write from your heart, write what it is that you want to say, and then present it, um, to, to an agent, a literary agent, and then the literary agents present it to us editors. And um, and congratulations, Marita, on Strong Black Woman. Thank you, Tracy. You know, that's, that's an area where I feel there needs to be um, more books and more um, uh, discourse on. Mm -hmm. uh, and I love the fact that um, in literature, there's been a lot of proposals that have come through about um, joy you know, finding joy in our lives because a lot of times we're dealing with uh, various struggles. And so, so I appreciate Marita's book and, um, and also others by um, Minda Hart, which I think are important to, to read. And also um, Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. Dr. Inger, um, which is about Black women's emotional well-being. And, um, and all of this to say, the most important thing is read. <laughs> <laughs> read, know what's out there, um, then write, and then present. Because you have to understand where your book fits in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. and, and it's an ever-shifting marketplace. And um, and things are happening very quickly in the industry, um, but I think it's a uh, it's wide open right now. People are very much looking for our stories um, because a they perform well, mm -hmm. or 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 win awards, or mm -hmm. and or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. And -or. Yeah. And I saw a comment that said uh, just now, finding Black joy is an act of resistance. And I love that. Um, I love that comment so much. I have a question for the audience, but also I would like to pose it to both of you. Um, and the question or rather statement is, what is a book written by a Black woman that has resonated with you throughout your life? Well, for me, it would probably be Their Eyes Are Watching God. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, in my book, my new book, The Strong Black Woman, because I'm a storyteller and not a therapist, I privilege stories and the healing power of stories. Mm -hmm. That is Black women telling me their stories of trauma and healing, um, stories of doctors and experts talking about our situation mentally and physically. But because I know that stories are deeply powerful, I end the book with an examination of Their Eyes Are Watching God. And that's a book that I read, reread regularly because it is such a healing book. And I talk about the ways in which Janie Crawford is in essence, a new age black woman. She grows from being a woman who is a young woman who is pretty much defined by her grandmother's uh, notions of happiness and what she needs to do with her life. And throughout the journey that she goes on in the book, she becomes a woman of independence. She becomes a woman who learns to love herself. She becomes a woman who practices joy actively. And mm -hmm. so that the it's very important for me that the final essay in The Strong Black Woman is about Janie Crawford and their eyes are watching God. Um, 
What about you, Tracy? I, I love that, Marita, that you chose Their Eyes Are Watching God. Um, Start Art Imprint, we, um, we handle Zora Neale Hurston now. And um, we just recently published a book called You Don't Know Us Negroes, which is a collection of essays by Zora. And I think I sent you one, Marita. Did I send you one? I'm still waiting for it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Everybody has said that as I await my copies as well. I will look into it. <laughs> Supply chain issues. Yeah. Supply chain issues. So I, I'm waiting patiently. <laughs> right. And, and you know, and Zora wrote that book in seven weeks. And that's what I found, you know, really outstanding. And it was based on a relationship that she was attempting to have. Mm -hmm. um, and so I love Their Eyes Are Watching God, too. I love Barracoon that Zora Neale Hurston Oh, that was did. amazing. Yeah. That was uh, amazing, yeah. Right? Just just, yeah. just outstanding. Yeah. And, um, and then I saw that, you know, the problem with being an editor, there's just, I read so much and there's so much that I've carried with me, you know, through the years. And anything by J. California Cooper. I mm. love all of her books. I think she was just an amazing genius. And then um, I'd have to say um, Bell Hooks, Ain't I a Woman and Bone Black um, and All About Love, you know, and Salvation. There's so many of her books that, that I love too. And I, I just, you know, and then there's um, somebody flashed across the screen, no disrespect. <laughs> my sister soldier, that too is that book has my heart, um, as well as others by Sister Soldier. And then most recently I read a book um called Hell of a Book by Jason Mott. Mm. And um that book was about how one as how a black man can come to hate himself mm. and be his mind be tarnished by racism and how he internalizes it. And that was uh, quite a remarkable book because it, it made me upset, it made me angry. Um, mm -hmm. It took me through a range of emotions. And, um, and then at the same time, I really enjoyed um, the messages. And, and that was just, you know, out, outstanding. So I also want to plug um, an amazing collection of stories and a novella called My Monticello by Jocelyn Nichols. And um, it's so inventive and so brilliant. And the, the central story then the novella is set in Charlottesville, Virginia, about a decade after the Unite the Right um, demonstration there and the violence. And just imagine if white supremacists were taking over the country and you are a descendant of Thomas Jefferson and you find yourself fleeing your home and you take refuge in Monticello while you're awaiting the chaos. And it's brilliantly written, um, vividly imaginative. And it's one of the best things I've read in a long time. And she's, she's an author who's, who's, I think she's 50, you know, and it's really great to see that as well as um, I want to plug also the secrets of church ladies. Oh, I love that. And I just said, read that that's going to be an HBO series. That is the most unapologetically, unapologetically wow. black book you will yeah. ever want to read. <laughs> yes. <laughs> wonderful. So, I mean, we could go on. Um, yeah. Yes. Just yes. <laughs> and then there's and then there's another one I want to mention too, which you know, in my Monticello, um, I have a copy of that that too, and it was done by our friend Rita Powers at Henry mm. Holt, which is just fabulous, and she's amazing. Um, but there's another one I want to mention that that I'm working on right now, and it's called Miss Chloe mm -hmm. by A.J. Verdell, and it's about her friendship yeah. with Toni Morrison. Okay. But but more than that, it's it affirms black writers, particularly black women, mm. and it is something something extraordinary. And um, on the back of the book, we have a quote from the book which says, um, "I'm going by memory here," which says that um, 
when a black girl goes into the, a library, you may not recognize her when she emerges. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Now, is that, this not, this is about the friendship between Tony and, and AJ. Yes. It's nonfiction. Nonfiction. Right. Memoir. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And really wow. written. Yes. That sounds amazing. All, all of these books sound amazing. Between the, the comments and the books that you guys have mentioned that I haven't read, I know I'm going to be running my debit card up tonight because this all sounds like brilliant work that I definitely want to get into and agree, Marita, with uh, Secret Lives of Church Ladies. Like That was probably my favorite read of last year. It was just so real and just, ugh, like I loved that book so much. Um, so Marita, can you share some of the challenges you faced when trying to get your work published? And then how did you overcome those challenges? Well, I was, I didn't have the, the usual experience. I, I think that next year will be the 40th anniversary of the publication of my first book, Migrations of the Heart. So I've been at this for seemingly a lifetime. So that when I uh, got my first contract in 19. 80, I got it with Marie Brown. She was a double day. And Marie Brown is a legendary figure in the world of publishing. She was one of the first black women editors and she midwifed a whole generation or more of black writers into publication and into having a public voice. Um, the irony was that when my agent submitted it to Marie, she loved it, but she said, I have, to, and this is how editing works. She said, I want to make sure I get your contract. So I have to wait until it's the right moment to, to, to put this book up. I can't put it up when we've done a book like it. I have to get allies among the other editors. So give me some time. Well, giving her time meant giving her a year. <laughs> and I'm a new writer. I'm screaming with my editor, what's going on? What is she doing? But it took her a year so that I didn't have to, um, you know, I didn't get a lot of rejections, but I simply had to wait a year. And once I was with Doubleday, I was with Doubleday for, you know, a very, very long time and with a different press now. But I think that rejection and things taking a long time is just part of it. It mm -hmm. really, really is. I mean, so many writers, you know, have stories of, I mean, I think uh, Tayari Jones said that her, her first book was reject, was told it should be a children's book. And um, Colson Whitehead got 27 rejections for his first book. And so rejection simply means that you, those publishers are not a good match, or it could mean that you need to do more work, but whatever, it's all called writing. All of it is writing, revisions writing, rejections writing, staying the course is writing. Totally, totally. And I actually was on a, um, listening to a panel earlier just about failure and how like you can't take failure to the heart. You just have to keep going, keep going, because those no's are going to eventually turn into a yes. Um, and so moving on to the next question, there used to be a time where authors would need to go through these major publishing houses to get their work out there. Now with social media and all these options for self-publishing, do you feel that it benefits the author now more to self-publish or to continue trying to go through um, publishing houses to get their work out there? Okay, I'll answer. I think... Uh... You, you know, and, and Marina, that was a beautiful thing that um, Marie could say to you, you know, now is not the right time and, and just, you know, and I'll let you know, you know, when it when it is. And, and I don't think we so much have that luxury anymore. And there's definitely some books I had to turn down because it wasn't the right time. And then a year later, two years later, I do want to go back to those and and find that author and who sent it to me and um and they're rarely still still available um and and perhaps the publishing didn't go so well you know when they did publish but um but that you know has makes the industry a little bit different um mm -hmm. now and so um i unless 
I, I know the, the pros and cons of both publishing with a publisher and self-publishing. And what I would say about self-publishing is if that's your job, promoting that one book, then you could probably make it. Mm -hmm. But that would have to be your, your only job. You can't have another full-time job and self-publish a book and think that you're going to be able to make the kind of traction you want to. Because um, Elin Harris was one of the first people to self-publish. And, you know, it was a full-time job. And, and those books were in his trunk. And he was driving all around and selling them. And he had a marketing degree. You know, there are different ebbs and flows in, in, in mainstream publishing where sometimes you can get a ton of reviews for a book and still the book doesn't sell. Mm -hmm. You can win awards for that book and then the book still doesn't sell. So whether you self-publish or publish with a mainstream publisher, it's very important to be a motivated individual because it takes a lot to sell a book and it's not a guarantee if you publish with a mainstream publisher that it does result in, in more sales. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I, I work with, in addition to doing workshops, I work as a writing coach and I work with people evaluating their manuscripts. And in fact, I'm going to be doing a workshop on self-publishing with Tracy McGee on April 2nd. And for more information, you can visit my website. But, you know, the self-publishing thing is so interesting because we live in a country where there's like Americans, every American has a story that they want to turn into a book, but Americans don't want to read a darn thing. Okay. The ratio of reading to wanting to be published is, 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 is crazy. And people have a lot of different reasons for wanting to self-publish. Sometimes a person will want to publish because they've had an interesting life. They don't have any idea about, I want to win a Pulitzer. I want to write a book so that I can give this to my grandchildren, so I can give this to my kids. Or I just want to write a book. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that self-publishing is a viable option. I think also that people have, as Tracy hinted a minute ago, a wildly um, inflated idea of what publishers, traditional mainstream publishers can do for a good book. So that even a book published by a legacy publisher, one of the big five, may or may not sell, even when everything is in place. And a self-published book published by a person who's, as Tracy said, really motivated, really smart, and gets out there, um, they may have a lot of success. So I think public self-publishing is a viable option. And I've taught in MFA programs around the country where increasingly, because there are so many more good writers than the industry can publish, more writers are independently self-publishing. People mm -hmm. who graduated from MFA programs, people that 15 years ago would have had no problem getting a deal. But we have in America, I think, Tracy, a glut <laughs> of really good writers. And yes, so, I think we do. So publishing <laughs> is out there for them. <laughs> I'm glad there's no stigma to it anyway. <laughs> and even before Elin, there was, of course, Don Lee, Haki Matabuti, and there was Nikki Giovanni. And mm -hmm. back in the day, when I was in college, they originally, they started out self-publishing. And then Broadside Press in Detroit began publishing Black writers. But there's a long tradition. Walt Whitman self-published. Okay, we really want to go back. <laughs> he, in fact, he wrote reviews of his own poetry books under a pseudonym. So <laughs> he was very motivated. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, self-publishing is fine. And Tracy is right that if your goal is to sell that book, it has to be your only job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And to Tracy's point, too, is like it would have to be your only job if you're self-publishing. But also, you know, 
there is no guarantee. So you can go through the major publishing houses and everything, but it's not going to guarantee the sales. Your work actually still has to be really good. And like you guys said, there are so many great uh, writers now. We just need to kind of catch up on the reading front. Um, so speaking of that, about a couple years ago, I joined Bookstagram um, and created kind of like a book account. And it really opened my eyes to just so many different pieces of art from Black women, but also just a community of Black women readers. And so my question to you guys is how important um, are book clubs and Black-owned bookstores and Bookstagram accounts ran by Black women to the success of Black women authors? Very, very critical. Very critical. And, um, and it's important for us to, to patronize the, the bookstores. And I myself of late have been discovering books on, on Instagram, you know, cause there's so many coming out that, you know, uh, it's been a little bit of a challenge to keep up. Whereas this is the first time that's happened, happened for me. Mm -hmm. And I try to, first of all, buy a copy of every black book that comes out. And then, um, and so now I'm, I've, I just have found myself catching up and, and I'm really pleased to see all, all the voices and, and the way that they're being published and, and how they're being done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, black women's book. Well, you know, the interesting statistic is that the most likely person in America to be reading a book is a college educated black woman. Oh, wow. More than any other segment of the population. Mm -hmm. and, the demographic yeah, yeah, of yeah. readers. And um, Black women's book clubs have been crucial in my career. Um, they're smart, they're savvy, they're dedicated, they're loyal. And so um, they're very, very important. And I'm glad to see after a period of where some of the independent bookstores were dying or closing because of the large, you know, Amazon and, 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 and all those places, more and more black women are opening bookstores around the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm noticing too, a lot of black women are also opening like virtual, like drop ship bookstores, which is neat to see. Um, I definitely agree of, you know, we all need to continue to patronize these businesses because that's what helps to keep our art alive. Um, about a couple years ago, I joined, I think the book club is called Book Girl Magic. And that was the first black woman ran book club I'd ever been in. You know, prior to that, I was kind of joining, you know, random ones ran by, you know, mostly majority white women. And so I remember going to my first book club and the experience was just like mind blowing to me because I'm like, wait, people are on here and they bond us. They're giving their real opinions. I feel like I am home. So I, I think that it's important to have those, you know, safe spaces for black women. And it's, you know, you see that black women, especially we're so supportive when it comes to, you know, reading and, and promoting books and things like that. So that's kind of how I find a lot of the reads that, you know, I get to is just from the people that I follow. Um, do either of you guys belong to any book clubs or have created a book club yourselves? No, I, I created a foundation. <laughs> yes. Talk about the Hurston Wright Foundation. Yes. <laughs> well, the Zora Neale Hurston Richard Wright Foundation is now 31 years old. And it was started back in uh, 19, 32 years back in 1990 by Clyde McIlvain and I. And we recognized that was a time when Terry McMillan, Alice Walker, Tony Morrison, these voices were beginning to really become quite prominent. And at the same time, more and more young black people were writing. So we wanted to create a national institution that would really provide community for black writers. And over the years, we have established a real, really important track record of creating community and honoring black writers, training black writers, mentoring black writers, and Tracy is one of our stalwart supporters. The support she's given us over the years has meant so much. And so I publicly thank you, Tracy. But uh, <laughs> thank you, Rita. so Hurston Wright is part of a family. You know, there's Kavi Kanem, Cabilio, Vona. And this is something that today's Black writers can really depend on. A whole community of Black people wherever they are. 
Mm -hmm. I love that. And for those that um, just saw the comment, uh, the website to read more about Hurston Wright is HurstonWright.org. Um, so if you guys want to check that out, feel free to go ahead. Um, and that just kind of goes into my next question about just upcoming projects or works that you guys want to share with the audience. Are there any other things, Marita, that you're working on or Tracy? Um, I want to call out the National Book Club Conference first. Um, that happens every year in Atlanta. Um, it's like over a thousand people usually yeah. go every year yeah. and they bring authors there and they brought, um, one year they brought um, one of my favorite authors, uh, Jennifer Lewis um, from Blackish. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Love her and love her book. And she has a new one coming um, in August, which I'm very excited about. And then I also have a, a book by Zane Asher, who is a commentator, uh, who has her own show on CNN International. Mm -hmm. And um, she's writing a book about her mother and, it's, and, and what the mother did to ensure that her four children were successful. So it's called Where the Children Take Us. And so, and the book opens with um, her mother getting a phone call that there's been a terrible car accident and that either her son or her husband is alive. And she finds out that her husband has been, you know, killed and she's very depressed, but her, her son is hanging on in the hospital for months. And so she has these four children and um, she sets up her house so that it becomes about them and about their studies and about their excellence. And it's how these Nigerian children, how, what the mother did to make them successful. Mm -hmm. And as well as everything that the mother went through in her own life. Mm -hmm. And so she ended up, her children were Zane Asher, a CNN commentator. One child is a businessman. Um, and then another child um, is an Oscar nominated actor. Mm -hmm. Um, Chitawel Injakor for, you know, for Selma. And so it was just phenomenal. And what the book overall shows is that how Nigerians are, have become the model minority. Yeah. They've knocked Asians out of that spot. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they're some of the richest and most successful, have the yeah. most doctorates and, and, um, and are outstanding. And so it shows how what's important, it gets us all back to our core values of learning and reading and writing and, and supporting each other as a family and a community um, mm -hmm. because that's what makes people successful. And, um, and I think we as a people, you know, need to get back to those roots too. So I'm very, you know, thrilled about that book. Um, I published a book called um, We Are Each Other's Harvest, which is about um, black farmers and the history thereof and everything they've been through. And, and it's just a phenomenal, beautiful, amazing book. The Secretary of Agriculture said it was an important book that people should read. Wow. And so, yeah, so you can understand what's, what's happened to our food chain, and why we have these food deserts and, mm -hmm. and all of those things. And so I'm really pleased about that. And of course, you don't know us Negroes and other essays by Zora Neale Hurston. And, um, and we're publishing a lot of really wonderful fiction on the Amistad list, um, particularly by Lady Hubbard, which I would really hope that people will go out and search her who did the Rib King and the talented Mr. Ripkin. Mm -hmm. and, um, and she has a forthcoming collection of stories. Um, the last standout. And so she's just really young, up and coming, but really an important writer. And so we're, we're thrilled to have her on the list. And I, and I hope that people will seek her out and, and, and discover her because you will, will not be able to for, forget her work. And, um, you know, in another Brooklyn by Jacqueline Woodson, which we published a few years ago, um, which is really great as well in the fiction category. And we have a new one coming by Diane McKinney Whetstone. And so I would hope that people would look out for that. And um, so we have a lot of great and important books, you know, by the 
we have a book coming from Deborah Plant called Of Greed and Glory. And Deborah Plant is the editor of Barracoon. Mm. And yeah, so she has this really powerful book coming out in, in the fall of this year. And so we're doing great things. Um, ben Jealous, we have a book coming from him who used to be the president of the NAACP. And so we're, we're expanding, growing, and what I think doing great things. And so those are the books that I'm excited about that, you know, and the great Miss Elias. Um, Hannah Elias was one of the first black millionaires out of slavery. Oh, oh. Yes. And so, and I did a book called Black Fortunes that performed extraordinarily well, which talks about the first six black millionaires. Um, so this is like slavery ended on Monday and on Wednesday they were millionaires because that's how fierce we are. But it didn't exactly happen like that, but that's how fierce we are as, as people, you know. And yes. uh, <laughs> right. Yes. And then <laughs> and so he so um Barbara Chase Rabod, who wrote Sally Hemings, did a book called The Great Miss Elias, which is a fictional account of how she gained her wealth and who she was as a person, but all based on a true story, you know, so. Awesome. It sounds like a lot of great things in the pipeline. I could just hear the money chinging in my ear, like, okay, gotta, gotta get that one, gotta get that one. So um, I think they're popping it right up on the screen now. So you guys be sure to check out all of these reads. Um, okay. Marita. And don't forget one more, don't forget <laughs> Just As I Am by Cicely Tyson. Oh, well, that's, that's, that's a great, yeah, yeah. Great, yeah, just read that one. That in three days or something, yeah. Yeah, that was a good one. Yeah. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so I'm, the response to the Strong Black Woman has been so gratifying and enthusiastic. So many people have just thanked me for giving Black women permission to set boundaries to say that they can ask for help, you know, to say that they don't have to be strong all the time. And I feel that I'm now kind of a soldier enrolled in this growing army of mm -hmm. women and others who are challenging a mythology that served our mothers and our grandmothers. And because the world that they lived in required that kind of invincible strength. But the fact that they were paying an enormous psychological and physical price for it was something that was unexamined. And so now we live in a world where we can examine it. And it's been very, very gratifying to, to see the reaction to the book. And in fact, I was so heartened by it that so many people ask me, well, Marita, what do you do? What are your practices? How do you stay mentally healthy, physically healthy? that I've written a workbook that will that can be used as a companion for mm -hmm. a strong black woman, um, which talks about mind taking care of your mind, joy, celebration, setting boundaries, and caring for your body. So and, and also because of the book, I've gotten many requests to to do mental health workshops. I'm doing a three month virtual residency at Johns Hopkins Medical Center, talking to the staff about self-care, um, mental and physical health, as well as I'm even doing a creative writing workshop on writing through stress, writing through the storm, I call it. And so this book that I started writing in 2020, almost as a way to heal during the crisis of 2020, um, has really taken me on a wonderful, expansive journey. And I find myself now, I asked myself a couple of months ago, um, who's going to write about 2020? Well, I know a lot of people are going to write about 2020, and I'm going to be one of them. I'm writing a novel um, set in Washington, D.C., a Black family going through 2020, um, the father is one of the early deaths. And so his wife, her two grown children are in quarantine, locked down with that legacy as well as other legacies. Awesome. 
that's that's amazing. Um, so I have one final question for you both. Um, a very easy question, I hope. So uh, what book are you currently reading? Well, I guess it's two parts. So what book are you currently reading? And then what book, if someone asks you, I need a good book to read, are you telling them to read? <laughs> well, right now I'm listening on Audible to um, Think Like a Monk by Jay Shetter. And it's a book about mindfulness and living a whole, healthy, balanced life. And actually, the book I read before that was As I Lay Dying by Faulkner, which is, I had gotten through college and I had, I, you know, Faulkner, Faulkner, but it's amazing. It's a masterpiece. And um, I read widely. My reading habits are very diverse. I read black people, white, I read everybody. I read nonfiction. I usually will read nonfiction and fiction. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm reading a lot of stuff, but that's that's what I just I just finished. And I'm teaching in my workshop, my um the the, the workshop that I'm doing most now, um, the secrets of church ladies. And we're having a lot of fun with that. Part of that, that I know that that discussion has to be good. <laughs> what about you, Tracy? Um, right now, I'm I'm um, overloaded with editing, <laughs> and so I'm not reading anything. Um, when we used to travel back and forth to work, I would allow myself 15 minutes to read on the way there and on the way back, and all that. Um, something I wasn't working on, and so when the, since that's been eliminated. It's uh, it's been a little bit challenging. Um, so um, right now, what I'm working working on and reading is um, a book called Morningside about the Greenboro massacre. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm also reading and editing a book on um, Black people and and work called Gray Areas um, by a wonderful uh, professor. And so I'm, I'm working on those two right now. And so I'm, I'm not, not reading anything. And, and I just <laughs> finished up uh, um, Jennifer Lewis's um, new one, um, going through that with her. So I'm not reading anything, unfortunately. I can tell you what I, I recently ordered. <laughs> 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 You that know. works, or if you want to share, you know, what book you would recommend to others to read that's just really good, that works too. <laughs> okay, I um, I just ordered um, um, the new um, the new repackaging of Angela Davis's autobiography that mm -hmm. that Toni Morrison originally published, mm -hmm. and so I I just ordered that. I it, the package looks phenomenal. And and just uh, amazing, and then um, and then uh, then I'll tell you like another book I've I that you know just changed my there are two books that changed my life forever, which was Toni Morrison's Sula. Oh my God! Yes. Yeah, which um, you know to me, um, what came out of that book, you know, because I read it very very young. With for me was, don't judge others. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't actually, and mm -hmm. then um, that that has lived with me, and Leo Buscaglia, Living, Loving, and Learning, which is written by a, a white guy. Yeah, I you know, but like I love him. Yeah, I yeah. love him. I love him. And um, and when I worked at Henry Holt, he came into the office one day, and I could not believe that that was him. <laughs> and I just went up there and. You know, we hugged him and, and <laughs> rocked back and forth and everything. And my publisher at the time said, "You two know each other." You know, and I had to tell her what his books are all about. <laughs> and um, yeah, and so and another interesting thing when I started at Henry Holt was there was a book by Toni Morrison, um, "The Bluest Eye." It was a first mm -hmm. edition that was hanging out on the bookshelf all by itself. It was a hardcover. I'm like, what? This is mine. This is mine. <laughs> I can take that off your hands. Exactly. This has been waiting for me. This is mine. Yeah. 
too. <laughs> and then later on, I found a couple others. So I have like three first editions of the bluest eye. And that wow. holds me and keeps me. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. But you know, in, in terms of really satisfying reads, I also had a tremendous amount of admiration for How Beautiful We Were by Mbolo Mbue. And um, she spent 20 years gestating and writing this book, which is a story of a village in an African country that um, suffers environmental degradation. Now that may not sound like a very interesting story, but it's people by such such a great cast of characters and she does it so well. It's beautifully, beautifully written and it covers about 40 years in the life of this village and the little girl who grows up to become an environmental activist. So if you're looking for a book that's set, you know, set on the continent and it's deeply rich and so powerful, um, How Beautiful We Were by Bolo Mbue. And don't forget her first one, Behold the Dreamer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That, uh, I, love that I love that book. I love that book. Mm-hmm. I love that book. Mm-hmm. And I have questions I want to ask her. And I never seem to be in the same room with her, you know, that I want to ask her about that book. And she's, I think she's a phenomenal writer. Phenomenal. Definitely. Well, we're going to have to figure out how to publish all of these reads in a list for everyone because there were so many great books mentioned tonight. Um, I just want to thank you both, Tracy and Marita, for joining us for this discussion. I want to thank the audience. Um, Everyone, if you aren't already following uh, Unerased Black Women Speak on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, feel free to go ahead and follow now. The uh, tag is Unerased. BWS. So uh, feel free to follow. Also follow Barita and Tracy. Um, I definitely will be following you guys' journey uh, moving forward. But thank you again for joining us tonight. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me. This has been amazing. Of course. I hope you have a Yeah.